Well, welcome everybody. Uh, glad to be back with you again. Uh, this is session nine of our class, Understanding the Forerunner Call, which is a part of our school uh, called the Forerunner School. And this title of this session is Forerunners as Intercessors. Forerunners as Intercessors. And that's really what we'll be talking about in this session is how forerunners must be intercessors also. So uh, it's part of the call and we'll deal into, get into a lot of depth into that topic. Uh, uh, but it's, it's a necessary uh, ingredient, a necessary issue, a necessary part of the call. Uh, let me just do a little bit of a review. Before, again, I'm trying to do this every, every session or pretty much every session so that we can kind of put each session in the context of the overall class and of the overall call that we have as forerunners. Uh, if you recall in the class, the first uh, session was about the days of Elijah saying that the th same things that were happening during the time that Ahab and Jezebel and Elijah were in the northern kingdom of Israel, we're living in those similar types of days uh, today. Uh, very little different, uh, really. I mean, of course, the circumstances are, are different, but the issues are very, very similar. And just as Ahab and Jezebel are on the rise and the tentacles of all that is on the rise, uh, and where God said, now Elijah, um, God is saying, I believe the same thing today. Now is the time for Elijah uh, to, to rise up. Uh, we need the spirit and the power of Elijah in the earth today to turn people back uh, to God. And so we did that in session one. Session two, if you remember, we did laid a, 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 what I believe is a solid biblical foundation for the fact that we're talking about end time forerunners. We're not talking about forerunners of, of another uh, era. Uh, there have been forerunners all throughout history, you know, at least going back to Noah, probably even before that, he was a forerunner. Uh, and there have been many throughout, uh, you know, Elijah and then again, John the Baptist and many others uh, as well. But we're talking about end time forerunners. We're talking about forerunners uh, who will function in this role that we're speaking about until the Lord returns. Now, we're not a date setter. We uh, believe we have a chance for this to be the generation that the Lord returns in if the, uh, if the church makes itself ready. Uh, and all the things come into to place that we are in that era, era that we could be the generation that sees the second coming of the Lord. But even if we're not, uh, until the Lord returns, I believe this anointing will be in the earth and it will ultimately usher in the second coming of Christ. So we laid the foundation for that in session two. And then in sessions three, four, and five, we dealt with uh, Luke chapter one, verse 16 and 17, very important uh, scripture passage, a couple of verses there uh, that have actually been our foundational uh, ministry calling uh, for decades now, but it really lays the, out the call of forerunners that, uh, speaking of John the Baptist in the immediate context of that, uh, that he was a forerunner in the spirit and the power of Elijah, who was to turn the hearts of the people back to, to the Lord uh, and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord and to turn the fathers to the sons and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous. I'm paraphrasing it, obviously, but, but that verse. So we dealt with that in depth. We dealt with what it means to turn people back to Christ, back to the Lord. We dealt with what it means to make people ready uh, for the second coming of Christ uh, in, in session uh, four. And then in session five, we dealt with the spirit and the power of Elijah. Uh, so we laid the foundation in these first five sessions. Then we, 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 then we took a shift. Uh, in session six, we began to talk about the various functions of the forerunner, the various roles that a forerunner will, will undertake in that role. Uh, and in session six, we dealt with the idea that above all, forerunners are a voice into the church, a voice into the a culture, a voice into the governmental system. They are a voice. Uh, forerunners will be used a lot more with their mouth than they will with laying on of hands. Uh, you know, we, 
Uh, we all love to pray for the sick and see them recover. We all love to cast out demons and do the, uh, and do the ministry things, prophesy and those kind of things. And all those are, are good and important. But the forerunner, the primary role of the forerunner is to be a voice. It'll be a voice that will turn people, will awaken people and turn them back uh, to Christ or turn them to Christ even for the first time. So that was session six. And then in session seven, we dealt with forerunners as end time messengers, uh, dealing with the various aspects of a messengerial roles. And it's very clear, speaking of John the Baptist, that he was called as a messenger uh, of uh, the Lord uh, and others as well. So we dealt with the role of a messenger, the end, uh, forerunners as end time messengers. And then in uh, session eight, we dealt with forerunners as wise master builders. Uh, the concept between the two was that the messenger goes, he announces, he calls, he invites. At times he warns, he confronts, he reasons, he clarifies, he does, does all these things. But the purpose of that is to wake people up and to get them ready to say, and, and to say, yes, I do want to turn back to truth. I do want to turn back to Christ. I do want to talk, turn to this person away from peripheral issues, away from sin, away from lower and lesser issues. I want to turn from those things and I want to turn uh, back to this man, Christ. Uh, and that was the role of the messenger. And then for those uh, who say yes, like what we're talking about as wise master builders in session eight, for those who say yes, the wise master builder then goes in and helps the people who have said yes to understand and to, and to know how to uh, be transformed into those things that the messenger has called them to do. And so forerunners function in both of those roles, messengers and master builders. Now, not, maybe not every forerunner functions in all of those, uh, but that is part of the overall forerunner call, messengers and master builders. Now, in this session and in the next, we will deal with two more uh, aspects of the functional role of the forerunner. This time, we'll we're going to focus on forerunners as intercessors and in the next session, we'll focus on forerunners uh, as friends of the bridegroom. Both of those are very key uh, issues as it connects uh, and relates to the forerunner call. Uh, and then the last two sessions, we're going to deal with the journey of the forerunner, how we have to uh, go on a journey ourselves to be prepared. So we'll deal with that in sessions 11 and 12. Uh, so anyway, that's what we want to do. We want to talk about in this session about forerunners as intercessors. I know I've taken a fair amount of time just to do a little bit of review, but I think it's important because it's so easy to get uh, it's so entangled in the trees, we lose sight of the, of the forest. And so uh, we want to make sure we step back uh, and to, to do those things periodically uh, as we walk through this class. So anyway, let's start with prayer and then we will get into the to topic of discussing forerunners uh, as intercessors. Father, we ask uh, for your anointing of, of the Holy Spirit upon this. I do pray that you would take me out of the way and that you would minister through me. I, want, I know that I am an earthen vessel and I ask, uh, Lord, that, that you're the treasure that is in me, the Holy Spirit, would come through and would speak with boldness and with clarity to explain and to encourage. Um, even since, Lord, that even as I'm praying this, that you want to encourage those whose primary call is intercessors, where they feel uh, like they don't, aren't able to speak to large groups or things like that, and they maybe even feel insignificant, but I, want, I believe you want them to feel uh, the importance of their role as intercessors. And so we ask for the anointing upon <clears throat> that and every aspect of what you want to do today. So we welcome you, Holy Spirit, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. That, I, that, was pre, that was not premeditated. I really do believe that those that might be listening to this or watching it, uh, those, especially those that are called uh, as intercessors, where that's their primary function, where they maybe don't have a platform for ministry to an individual or to a group or whatever, and they, they, 
devote their ministry time to intercession and, and prayer, spiritual warfare. Uh, I want you to know uh, that, and I believe the Lord does, that this is a crucial dynamic uh, within the forerunner call. And we'll deal with that in the, in the session, but it's absolutely necessary for all forerunners to be intercessors. But there are some, there are some, a lot probably, there are some who, um, who their primary role, their primary function uh, is to intercede. And that uh, I want to make sure that those who that is their role understand that that is a very, very, very important aspect of the forerunner call. Uh, the Lord has spoken and shown Donna and I over the decades that we've been involved in ministry that really nothing happens in our lives without prayer and without uh, even spirit times of spiritual warfare. Nothing of God takes place without that. And so, uh, and that's true with the forerunner call. You're not going to change people's uh, heart. You're not going to change their lives. You're not going to really turn them back uh, to, to God. We can't do anything. It's only God who can do it. But we, what we can do is pray and ask him uh, to do that. And so anyway, uh, uh, that's just a word for those who have a, a specific call as intercessors. But uh, I really believe uh, all of us, every forerunner needs to be uh, involved in the role of intercession. So anyway, let's look at it. Uh, um, section, sec, section one of this is called Call to Pray. Uh, and we want to look at first at, the, at Elijah. Uh, Elijah was a, was a spiritual warrior and he was a, a, an intercessor. Uh, you know, if you begin to uh, look at um, 1 Kings chapter 18, uh, starting with about like verse 36 uh, or so, we see the confrontation that uh, he had with the prophets of Baal and the prophets of the Asherah. Uh, you, and you'll see what you'll see is it's a, obviously a time of spiritual warfare where he's in a time of confrontation uh, with these prophetic uh, people who were trying to put in an entirely different worship system. It wasn't a, a, a uh, different way of worshiping Yahweh. It was, it was a complete opposite system of worshiping a totally false God. And he was in confrontation with them. He was before the people. He was, he was uh, interceding, but he was in spiritual warfare for, with them. So we see him participating in spiritual warfare in this 1 Kings 18 uh, verse 36. Um, I won't read all of it. Uh, this, this is probably too much. It's in your notes. Uh, but at the time of the evening offering, Elijah the prophet came near and said, now, now what I want you to see is how he is directing his warfare not to the prophets of Baal and not to the Asherah and not to the false gods. He's directing his intercession, his warfare to God. He says, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and I have done all these things at your word. And then he says, answer me, O Lord, answer me that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back again. Uh, and then as he prayed these things, fire fell from heaven, consumed the sacrifice and, and the victory uh, was won against the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asherah. When the people saw this, a little bit later in this passage, when all the people saw this, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, speaking of Yahweh, not of Baal, speaking of Yahweh, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And then after that, uh, the prophets of Baal were seized and were uh, destroyed. And so you see this, you see this prayer. He was praying in a context of spiritual warfare uh, in a forerunner type of mentality to turn people back to, to Yahweh from false worship. Uh, we see that in that passage. Now, the, in, that's not all we see in context of Elijah's prayer. Of course, we see he had prayed a lot for individual needs and things like that too. But in terms of the context of his forerunner call, uh, he also prayed uh, to end the drought. Uh, this is in 1 Kings 18, uh, 41 through 45. This is when, after the confrontation. Uh, uh, Elijah said to Ahab, go up and eat and drink, uh, for there's the sound of the roar of a heavy shower, you know, about rain. 
Uh, and so uh, what, did, what did Elijah do? But Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel and he crouched down on the earth and put his face between his knees uh, and he said to his servant, go out and look uh, for rain. So he did that a number of times. But here's the point. He, when he got in that crouching position, put in his face between his knees, he was putting himself in a birthing position. That was at that time the position that when women gave birth, childbirth, they uh, got into that position uh, uh, for, for childbirth. And so he was getting in a birthing position uh, position. So what, what was he doing? He was birthing through prayer uh, the end of the drought. He was birthing the rain. Yeah. You know, the, uh, the mission had been accomplished. Uh, he had turned, the people had turned, at least for that point in time, had turned back to God. And so he got into that crouching position, birthing uh, the, the end of the drought that he had prophesied three and a half years earlier. Uh, and so we see Elijah was a man of prayer. He prayed birthing things and he prayed uh, in spiritual warfare. Now we see it also, um, we see intercession also in the life and ministry of, of the Apostle Paul. Uh, as a messenger and a master builder, we see uh, that he was a man committed uh, to prayer. Now I'm not going to read a lot of the scriptures here, but there, if you'll read through uh, the book of Acts, especially starting with uh, Acts 13 or so, or even before that, when Paul comes on the scene, his missionary journeys, and you read about them. Also in his letters, the Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, a number of his letters, you see his commitment to prayer. Uh, Paul was a, was a man of prayer. Um, there, there's a verse of scripture, I like it, and I've used it before in this uh, class, and I, I really like this. It's Galatians chapter 4, verse 19. And Galatians 4, verse 19 uh, says to the people, I am in labor again until Christ is formed in you. Now, his labor uh, obviously included his ministry, his preaching, his teaching, and his apostolic ministry, but it also included his intercession. He labored in intercession. That word labor uh, is the word travail in childbirth is the meaning of that word in the Greek. Uh, and so what did he do? He travailed, he labored until in intercession as well as ministry until Christ was formed in the people. And so you can see he was a man of prayer. Now you see his prayers in, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, 18, that were in there, Colossians chapter 1, uh, Ephesians chapter 6. You see a, a lot of uh, different uh, applications of his call to prayer. But Paul, as a messenger, he was a man, we, we dealt with this in the last two sessions. Paul was a messenger and he was also a wise master builder. And in that role as messenger, a forerunner, as a messenger and a wise master builder, uh, Paul was a man of prayer. He, he, he in, incorporated intercession. He incorporated prayer into the forerunner call. Um, and so just to summarize, we, we have to be that way too. If we're going to be a forerunner, if we're going to be a messenger, if we're going to be a master builder or a friend of the bridegroom or a voice, any of the things, aspects of what we've been talking about, if we're going to be effective in any of those things, we must become a person and a people of prayer uh, and intercession. It's absolutely uh, crucial uh, to do that. There are like four um, events. Uh, there are a lot of personal things in my life that led me to appreciate the importance of prayer. Not all of them were, were positive. A lot, of them were, a lot of them were like major challenges in uh, my life and uh, major challenges in terms of uh, uh, financial provision and various issues like that uh, where the Lord used all those things to teach me that prayer was crucial in my own life, my own family life. And, and you see, I'll take a little side note here, you see in the New Testament, you know, we're talking about praying for forerunner type of issues, uh, eternal purpose issues and things like that. But you see there's a lot of calls for personal prayer too. I, I don't want to in any way suggests that we're not to pray 
for personal needs or healing or health, financial provision, family issues. Yes, the scriptures talk about that a lot. Uh, and there's some things in the notes here that will refer to that. But I'm not going to take time uh, for that. Uh, but uh, as, you, as you see that, what you see is that, uh, what I've seen is that there is a real need for prayer. And the Lord's put four things in our ministry time that really solidified in our hearts the importance of prayer and intercession as a forerunner from the for standpoint of the forerunner standpoint. Let me just go through them real quickly. Uh, the first one was back in 1996 when we began to get the forerunner, the call as a forerunner. I've mentioned this before, but no man from Australia who later became a, a, a great friend of ours came for the first time to our church. And then he would come every year or two uh, for a, a couple of decades, really, I guess. And his call to us, I mean, he was an intercessor. There's no doubt about it. He was an intercessor. But he... he made it very, very clear, abundantly clear, that if we were going to be a forerunners, we must be a, a people of prayer. We must be a people of prayer. You cannot, this was his theme, you cannot be a forerunner without being a person of prayer or a ministry of prayer. And so that kind of started uh, in our hearts so much that it kind of became part of our DNA that we realized that we were not and I'm not saying that we're great, that great at it now, but as a ministry, we were committed from early on as a forerunner ministry to become a people of prayer, become a house uh, of prayer. Uh, so that was the first uh, call. The second uh, point that solidified in our hearts was when a year later, this began in 96, but in 1997, the Lord called Donna and I to go to Mike Bickle's Passion for Jesus conference in Kansas City. And at that point, he was speaking about the call as forerunners. And we, uh, we heard that call like never before. It, it, it just uh, was like a, just something in our heart that said, I can never be content ever again with any other call other than that. Lord, the Lord did something really, really uh, impactful in our lives in, in 1997. That it was sealed. That, that call was secured. It was sealed and it still hasn't changed since then. But the point I want to make for here is that in that call at, at that time, Mike Bickle, who has that call as a forerunner, was also uh, a, a man in a ministry. His ministry was a ministry of intercession. It had a tremendous anointing and call to intercession. So we see the connection between the forerunner call, again, through, this is a totally different person, a to, the connection between intercession and the forerunner call, absolutely uh, essential uh, that is there. Now, he had not yet started the 24-hour house of prayer, but he was a man committed to intercession and committed to prayer, and he was known uh, for that. Uh, and then the third thing, this go, going back to Noel Mann, uh, I'm not sure if it was the first time he was with us or one of the times early on he was with us. And I've shared this story before, but he was calling our church to be a house of prayer for the nations, a house of prayer for America, a house of prayer for Israel, and a house of prayer uh, for the nations. And as he was calling us to this, this ghoulish sound comes over our loudspeaker system saying, no, no, no. And so he obviously said, yes, yes, yes. And as he did that, uh, it was a real, um, real confirmation to us that we had to be that house of prayer. And the enemy wanted to resist that. Of course, the enemy does not like the church praying. Uh, he really resists prayer. But we knew we had to be that. Uh, and then the fourth thing uh, was in 2015. This was later on uh, when Terry Bennett had come to our church, the first time he had come. Uh, that weekend on the Saturday morning session, uh, there was an encounter where an angelic being came into the room uh, that Saturday morning, and that angelic being gave a specific summons to our fellowship, uh, which was a summons uh, to the golden altar, a summons to the golden altar, and based on Revelation chapter 8, and we'll deal with that in just a few minutes, but uh, there was a lot more to it. Uh, than that. I won't take the time to go through that. We do have actually a, a class on 
Becoming an Eternal Purpose House of Prayer, which is part of the Forerunner School, where we'll go into more detail on that. But uh, the, the point for now is that we knew if this, what, what happened with this uh, encounter, because we knew we were a house of prayer by that point in time, but what this did was it, it secured a specific type of prayer uh, that we needed to pray that changed really uh, pretty dramatically, actually, uh, our focus in uh, prayer. And we're still on that journey. Uh, but through those uh, four encounters, we realized that we are uh, called as to be intercessors and, and, and secured the point, that the main point for this session is that forerunners must be uh, intercessors. Um, so let, let's talk now about the need for a new wineskin for prayer. Um, forerunners are called to pray, which we've talked about, but the, pray, the type of prayer is different uh, than I would say probably a lot of people who are at least just, jo just beginning this journey as a forerunner uh, have been praying. It certainly was for us. Uh, it's a different type of prayer. Um, so let's talk about that for a few minutes. Uh, let, before, as we do that, as we begin that, I want to just kind of dig a little bit into review of the of eternal purpose. Remember, because we want to say, what are we praying for? If it's going to be different, we need to kind of know uh, why. So this kind of, it's a review, but it lays the foundation for why we need to pray differently. Remember in session three, we dealt with five aspects of how we need to turn people back to, to Christ. Uh, back to the, and I just quickly go through them. The per, back to the person of Christ. Uh, forerunners turn people back to God's eternal purpose. Forerunners turn people from the focus on external things of God to an internal kingdom. Forerunners turn the hearts of leaders to their spiritual children, where it's not all about the leaders, but it's about equipping the church. Um, and then forerunners turn the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous. So that's kind of why forerunners exist, to turn people back to Christ and these things related to this man, Christ Jesus. And there are three objectives on that. This was in session four. Three objectives to prepare a corporate man, uh, the way I've put it in the notes for prepare a corporate mature man who will be made ready as God's partner for the eternal ages to make people ready for that. Point two, forerunners are to make ready a people for the end times and to make people ready for eternity, those three objectives. And so we see we forerunners help people turn to these five uh, purposes to, uh, so as to accomplish these three objectives. Um, and, uh, you know, with ministry and all that is an important part of that, but, uh, but prayer is a part, an essential part of it too. Um, and as we talk about a different type of prayer, we need to realize that most of the Western church, for sure, and this is not true so much in Africa, uh, you know, and maybe other, a lot of other nations where their life depends on prayer. But in the Western church where our economy has been good and healthcare system is good and, uh, you know, a lot of, we can live off the prosperity of the land pretty successfully in a lot of ways. And so the church has been either prayerless, most of the church has been either prayer, prayerless uh, totally or uh, they engage in prayer focused on individual needs. Uh, you know, if you've been in church for a while, a, a denominational type of church or whatever, uh, you realize that, you know, compared to the size of the congregation, there's a very, very small percentage who come to the corporate prayer meetings even. And then a lot of those prayer meetings are uh, based on um, just making individual needs. I mean, I remember when I first started in ministry, I was part of a denominational, traditional denominational church. I was on the staff there, and uh, I would have to lead at times, not every week, but lead at times the midweek prayer meeting. Uh, and it lasted an hour, and it would be like you'd spend about 50 minutes of that hour 
people would be raising a request. But it was never anything really significant. It was never like, my marriage is falling apart, help me, I, I need your prayers. It was like, my aunt's third cousin, husband, uh, got a, has a hangnail, can you pray for him? You know, it was that type, that level of, of intercession or prayer needs. And then by the time you finished getting all the prayer requests, there was only like five minutes left and you said, well, let's just have a sentence prayer. Lord, you've heard our requests. We ask that you answer them. That was kind of like the, the prayer, uh, the corporate prayer uh, at this denominational church at our prayer me meetings. Uh, so a lot of churches are prayerless completely, but then a lot of others or are uh, praying based on individual needs. And so when, and, there, and like I said earlier, it, it it's great to pray for individual needs. I mean, if somebody is sick among us, we pray for them. If there's a, somebody is bound up with, with demonic strongholds, we pray for them. If people need encouragement and they're depressed and downcast, we need to pray for them. So I'm not, I am not saying that we don't need to pray for individual needs, but there's a different type of prayer uh, that, that is needed. Uh, you, you know, Luke chapter five it talks about... Uh, uh, new wineskins. It says that, you know, you can't put new wine into old wineskins because it'll break them and it'll, you'll, you'll lose the wineskin and the wine. It says also that you can't put a, a, a new piece of garment onto an, uh, to a patch onto an old cloth because it would tear off. Uh, and so this is really true. And, the, and it says, ends with the, the, the old is not good enough. This is Luke chapter 5, verse 36 through 39. I won't turn to that. But uh, it's, it's so true, you can't, you, you can't put eternal purpose prayer into the old wineskin of the way prayer has been done in many, many places. And you definitely, uh, if we talk about being forerunners uh, in the spirit and the power of Elijah, you cannot patch on eternal purpose prayer and the prayer of the forerunner uh, on to a, a, the way you have been doing it. It's going to require a totally, for most of us, a totally different approach to prayer and to intercession. Uh, this is what has happened in our church. Uh, it's been gradual, uh, but, and we've still got a long ways to go, but that's, that's the journey that we're on, to, to see a new wineskin of prayer uh, to be uh, produced. Um, so it's very important that we understand that. Um, in forerunners, and we will talk about in a minute about forerunners, uh, the ways that prayer must be different. But here, I want to kind of just lay it out in a general sense. T two uh, aspects. Forerunner, two things forerunners must do. Forerunners must pray. In other words, like Paul's uh, message in Galatians chapter 4, he, we must pray, labor for Christ to be formed in a people. So we have to pray for God's eternal purposes to be fulfilled and the enemy to be restrained who would resist uh, the eternal purpose uh, being fulfilled. So we have to pray for those things. That's one aspect. The other aspect, though, is that we must also, as forerunners, we must also change churches. The, 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 let me say it this way. We must also change the prayer ministry of churches and of lives that we are forerunners, we are a voice into. Part of being a voice is to bring a new wineskin, a new um, approach to intercession in that uh, in that church. Um, one of my visions, my, one of, part of my vision in this last leg of my ministry is to raise up a, a, uh, a company of uh, forerunner missionaries and a network of forerunner mission bases. And one of the things that I want these mission bases to, to have is a, an eternal purpose based house of prayer uh, that uh, will pray into these things of Christ being formed in a people. <clears throat> That's my desire. I really want that uh, in my 
uh, in, in the churches that I was able to be a voice uh, into. Very critical there. Uh, and so there's two aspects that one of it, we've got to pray. For, as forerunners, if we're going to be a voice into somebody's life or another church's life or whether an individual's life, whatever it is, we have to pray for them. <clears throat> we cannot just speak to them and then not pray for them because nothing will happen without prayer. That's one aspect of it. But the other aspect is that as forerunners, we need to build this new wineskin of prayer into the lives of individual believers and into churches so that we not only pray for them, but that we equip them to pray uh, these eternal purpose types of prayers uh, in their own churches and in their own lives and their own families. So there's two, two aspects uh, of that. So let's look at, with that kind of understanding, let's look at some ways that our prayer uh, must be different. Uh, first one is that the church's prayer ministry must be focused on filling the, whole, the heavenly golden incense bowls. It must be focused on that. Now, I'm not going to read all this, but you, in your notes is Revelation chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. And this is talking about uh, John was, uh, saw a heavenly, uh, the golden altar, heavenly golden altar. And at the heavenly golden altar, that, and this is not the altar of sacrifice, this is the altar of incense. He saw that uh, in, in heaven in, a, in, a, in his encounter. Uh, and he saw that, the, that the, the golden incense bowls were full, and they were full of the prayers of the saints on the golden altar. The prayers of the saints had filled that. And another verse right, similar to that, Revelation chapter 5, verse 8, uh, talks about golden bowls full of incense, uh, which are the prayers of the saints. And so what do we see? Now, if you put those in context, Revelation 5, Revelation 8, uh, initiate the, those things, initiate judgment, end time judgments that ultimately return, come to the fulfillment of the return of Christ. So it's part of the church preparing the way for the Lord re to return is to fill these golden bowls uh, of incense. Now, you know, this is where we got the summons to the golden altar back in 2015 as a church. And as, as we got that, I had no idea really what was, what was even being talked about. Uh, so it took a lot of prayer, a lot of waiting on the Lord, a lot of uh, just teaching. And over time, the Lord has given me a lot of insight into it. And also, it's somewhat similar in timing, the Lord began to unveil to us uh, eternal, God's eternal purpose. And that really, really helped uh, because that kind of gave us the target. And, and so here's, here's, the, here's what fills, in my opinion, this is my interpretation, what fills the golden incense bowls are the prayers of the saints that are kingdom focused uh, and are specifically focused on the fulfillment of God's eternal purpose in the lives of individuals and in the lives of the church. Uh, it's a kingdom focus intercession. Now that do, again, that does not mean that we can't pray for individual needs. Uh, we absolutely can and we should and, we, and I do. And, uh, and I've seen a lot of answered prayers in those things. So I'm not minimizing that whatsoever. But in my opinion, those types of prayers do not contribute to the filling of these golden incense bowls. It's kingdom focused, eternal purpose focused, uh, intercession that fills the golden incense bowls. And you probably are thinking like I am, boy, these bowls are pretty empty right now in the, in the global church. And I think they are, but God can fill them pretty quickly too. If we as forerunners will pray and as we will equip the church uh, to pray. So uh, that's the first point of, of ways that prayer must be different. Uh, it must be focused on filling the heavenly golden incense bowls. Second point on ways it needs to be different. The church's prayer ministry must be focused on the fulfillment of God's eternal purpose. Um, again, I touched on that in this last point, uh, but very, very 
critical. That's the kind of prayer that will fill the golden incense bowls is, is uh, prayer that will fill God's eternal purpose. So we talked about this in a prior session, but Revelation chapter 12 talks about the birth of, a man, of the man-child, which is a mature man. Uh, this mature man, when that comes forth, is birthed from the womb of the church. From, when it's birthed from the womb of the church, the mature man, that will be the event that will cast the dragon uh, from the mid heavens down to earth will initiate the last three and a half years of the tribulation period and then will begin the transition uh, into the age to come. Uh, but it, it, if you'll notice in Revelation chapter 12, the woman, which is not totally just the, the church, but let's just say that for now. Uh, we have a, uh, in our end time class, we deal with that extensively, that entire passage. But the womb, uh, let's say from the womb of the church is birthed this mature man. But the woman was in travail. The woman was in travail birthing this man-child. Uh, and so this is, this is the key point here. The church, forerunners and the church in general, must include in its prayer ministry this ministry of birthing the man-child, which would include at times travail. And it doesn't have to be travail when we are overwhelmed in the Spirit and crying and weeping and all. That's good when it's, uh, when it's Holy Spirit initiated. But the, the whole issue of birthing through prayer uh, and ministry too, but through prayer, the, this man-child. This will, is a key uh, thing uh, to... Uh, to transition the earth uh, from the church age to the age to come. And this is in, in, a, this is in accordance with God's eternal purpose. And so we do this by travailing that Christ be formed in a people, the hope of glory. The, that's God's eternal purpose. And we'll, we've got a whole class on that as well uh, that will that'll be in the forerunner school. But Intercession for that must be, uh, must be there. That's part of filling these golden incense bowls. Uh, a third uh, topic is that prayer that will fill the heavenly incense bowls must be prayer from a heavenly uh, perspective, from a heavenly perspective, not an earthly perspective. This is really important, and, and it may be subtle in some ways, but very, very important. Uh, if you begin to look at God's eternal purpose, you see that God's eternal purpose is Christ-focused, not man-focused. Now, a lot of the ministry of the church is, is man-focused. Man is the center. Man is the head, almost. Uh, it's Christ, and it's for the good pleasure of the Godhead. Ephesians chapter 1 talks about that a lot. God's eternal purpose is for the, is for the good pleasure of of the Godhead. For, for the Lord wants Christ to be preeminent. He wants him to be central. He wants uh, him to have an equally yoked bride that will be the, his eternal partner for the, all the ages to come. That's what God's desire. And the Father wants a family of mature sons. Uh, so that's, that's God's uh, eternal purpose. And that's his focus. And that's the focus of the, of the prayer. But to pray that, we have to pray from a heavenly perspective. Uh, I mean, I know we, we're changing this now in our own church's prayer ministry, but for years, decades even, we prayed for America and we prayed for various issues, but we prayed from an earthly perspective. Uh, let's just use America as, as an example. Um, America is in a lot of ways, I mean, in a lot of ways, it, there are a lot of godly people in America, but in a lot of ways, the, uh, the, the culture is godless. Uh, abortion is rampant and, and a number of other issues. I won't take the time to go into all the issues, but you, you know that America has turned, our culture has turned away from Christ. Um, and so, but we were praying for things like, you know, governmental bills before Congress. And some of those are necessary, absolutely necessary to pray for. Like right now, as I'm teaching this, uh, Amy Coney Barrett is, is being evaluated before to be confirmed to the Supreme Court. And that's a, 
that would be a, a, a national issue to pray for that we could pray for from a heavenly perspective because uh, I believe that uh, she will be a voice into the court to bring us back to, to, to some godly values in a number of of ways, but we weren't. But, so that's one of these issues you can pray from a heavenly perspective. But there are a lot of other governmental things going on, and that were more political and more um, just wanting to pray for issues that made our life more comfortable. Uh, see, if we prayed for God to come into America to turn us back to Christ, uh, who knows? what that would create in our economy uh, if God answered that prayer. Because as long as things are going smoothly and there are no problems, uh, people are, for the most part, are not going to turn back to God. I mean, uh, it'd be great if they would, but that may not happen. So we have to pray from a heavenly perspective. Lord, bring this man-child, bring this corporate man, bring this mature a person exalt Christ in America, whatever it takes. Uh, and when you say that and you start praying that, you're realizing that you're praying from a heavenly perspective, but you're praying things that may not be as comfortable for your own personal life. But we are agents of Christ. Uh, we're messengers of Christ, not of, for our own comfort and our own pleasure. So that's important. Must we pray from a heavenly perspective? The next one of these ways that our prayer must be different. Eternal purpose prayer will also include prayer uh, for the nations. Uh, really kind of goes along with this last point I made, uh, but it will be prayer for the nations, but again, from a heavenly perspective. Yes, we're to pray for America. Uh, yes, we're to pray for Israel. Yes, we're to pray for the nations of the earth as God puts them on our hearts. But we pray from a heavenly perspective, not from a national perspective. Uh, another point, the goal of God's eternal purpose also requires prayer to restrain and resist those forces that would hinder the coming forth of a people filled with Christ. Um, we're, so we're to pray to restrain the spirit Antichrist system, the spirit of Antichrist, and the Babylonian culture of the, of the Queen of Heaven, the harlot, the great harlot. Um, you can see this in type and shadow form in the book of Esther pretty well, where Esther was called to be the bride of King Assyrius. Uh, she prepared, uh, she pleased him in the, in the secret place. She was granted the scepter of authority, the rod of authority. And how does she use that? She used that uh, to defeat Haman, uh, to turn the tables on Haman and his 10 sons, which is a picture of the Antichrist uh, system. And so the intercession of forerunners and of the church uh, needs to be somewhat like that. Um, you know, you see... You know, you see a lot of things like that. You see in, in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, you see Paul uh, interceding against the, the uh, standing strong and praying without ceasing against the uh, spiritual forces of wickedness and, and enemies in heavenly places, etc. Uh, you see also the, 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 in uh, Revelation how God is calling the church out of the harlot Come out of her, my people, that you don't participate in her sins and receive of her plagues. Um, so, you, you know, that's, again, uh, part of this uh, uh, prayer to restrain. Now, we're not, I'm not saying that we confront demonic principalities. Absolutely not. But we pray, just like Elijah prayed to God uh, and, and the, those were defeated. But there is a dynamic related to that. Uh, that is involved in, in the prayer of the forerunner uh, and the prayer that the forerunner helps the church to enter into uh, as well. And then the next one uh, is that the, the eternal purpose church will pray for Israel. Uh, we must pray uh, for Israel. Uh, there, Israel will be the focal point of end time events in many ways. Uh, and, you know, Isaiah 62 
uh, 7. It says, On your walls, O Jerusalem, I have appointed watchmen all day and all night. They will never keep silent. You who make the Lord, you who remind the Lord, take no rest for yourselves and give him no rest until he establishes and makes Jerusalem and Israel a praise in the earth. And so there is a call to pray uh, for Israel in the context of that. And it won't take time to go into all that. We, we have an entire session on that in our class on the forerunner on eternal purpose intercession. Um, now, the need for forerunners uh, to pray, uh, there's, there's different uh, uh, aspects of this. So let's just go quickly through this. Um, not too much more in this session. Um, forerunners must include, some of this we've already talked about, but there there's, uh, have six aspects of the mandate for forerunners to function as intercessors. Um, we, we must, for, uh, prayer is, is not an option. We have to pray. We have, forerunners must be a people of prayer, which we've talked about. Um, First and foremost, forerunners must pray that they themselves are transformed into the tenants. We're looking at these six uh, ways that we need to pray. Uh, forerunners must pray that they themselves are transformed into the tenants of God's eternal purpose and for their forerunner call to, to grow as God so desires. In other words, forerunners must pray that they be transformed. Yeah, you know, that's one thing that I spend a lot of time for on. Uh, when I say a lot of time, I probably need to do more, but it's definitely an, a, an aspect of my prayers that, Lord, as I see these things, as I teach them, so Lord, help me to be this. I want to be the prepared bride. I want to be a mature son. I want to be a part of a people made ready. I, help me, God. Uh, cruci I see my flesh. I see uh, my self-life. <clears throat> and I, I say, Lord, I want to be made ready. Help me. So, you know, forerunners have to be on this journey themselves. You cannot be a voice into other people's lives if you're not on the journey yourself. That was what the uh, Jesus confronted the Pharisees about. They were whitewashed tombs. They were full of dead men's bones. And we don't want that in our own lives. So we have to be praying that God would help us and to transform us into those things. Second, forerunners must... Uh, pray for people to receive the message that forerunners speak as end time messengers. Uh, you know, that's a major thing. You know, we can speak uh, this message this very eloquently and fluently. We can speak these messages, but we have to pray that they would receive it because the enemy tries to resist them. He will cause them to be deaf and blind to the message, to what we're saying. And so we need uh, to pray. For that, you know, Paul did that in Ephesians chapter one. You know, Ephesians one was the the chapter of eternal purpose, and at the, toward the end of the chapter, he's talking about, "I don't cease praying for you that you would have a spirit of wisdom and revelation and understanding to know all these things." And so we have to pray uh, along those lines that the people that we are forerunners to, that we do, that we pray for them to receive this message. And now third, the forerunner must also pray for those who have received the forerunner message uh, to gain revelation knowledge and understanding of how to walk through every step of transformation. Uh, we have to pray for these things to give people understanding. You know, I've heard this a lot of times. Like it really happened when we had the summons to the golden altar. Uh, people, people were not resisting that we got summoned, but they said, what do I do? Can I not pray like I used to? How do I pray? And I, it took me a while to get to the point that I could answer them because I was trying to figure it out myself. Uh, but we have to pray that they would understand how to walk out these various aspects of being made ready uh, for the Lord in accordance with his eternal purpose. Um, the next, the fourth point, forerunners must labor until Christ is, is formed within a people in fullness. Now we've talked about that uh, a lot. Galatians 4 deals with that. Colossians, there's a prayer in Colossians uh, 1, chapter 1, verse 25 through 29. Uh, well, there's earlier than that even in, in the book of Colossians. Uh, 
there's, I think starting with verse 9 or so, it deals with that. Uh, that pray that people would walk in that manner worthy of the Lord, to please Him in every uh, respect. So we need to, uh, to pray that Christ would be formed in a people. Very important prayer. The fifth one uh, is that forerunners as wise master builders must help individual believers in local churches to become an eternal house of prayer. Uh, this was, uh, again, uh, the part of that two points. One, pray for the transformation and then pray, uh, help people to become that house of prayer too, which would include prayer, but it would also include working with them and giving them uh, insight into how to pray these new wineskin types of prayers. Uh, uh, and then the, fi the final point uh, for the message, and I said this at the beginning, but I want to just end with this too. Whereas all forerunners are to intercede, intercession will be the primary call upon many forerunners. Uh, that's a very important point to understand that some of you who will be watching, listening to this, reading these notes, some of you will not, your primary role will not be to speak. It will not be to uh, transform a church or to speak into a pastor's life or to speak into a individual believer's lives. You may have opportunity over a cup of coffee or something to talk to a, a friend or something like that. I mean, obviously, probably all of us will have that kind of opportunity. But it may not, your, your role may not be a major role into speaking into others' lives. It may be to pray. You, your role may be to intercede. And again, I don't want to minimize anybody to feel that that is not a, as significant a role. It's very, very important. In fact, I believe it's probably even more important than speaking into lives. Both are important, but this is much is very important as well. Uh, so, what, so some of you may just be called as intercessor, and that's great. But whatever your call, whether you're called to be a voice, to speak, whether it's intercession, Whatever it is, every forerunner must be committed to prayer. Uh, it is a major role, and forerunners must be also intercessors. Uh, God bless you, and thank you for your attention. Uh, and uh, we will go in the next session into Friends of the Bridegroom. God bless you.